Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are going to get started here in just a couple minutes. First, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Rachel. I will be the host today and kind of helping Dr. Russell here as we go through the presentation. Um, just a few things to start out. We have kind of a big crowd here, so I want to make sure um, we keep it kind of organized here. Along the bottom of your screen, you should have a chat button, a raise your hand button, and a question and answer button. Um, at any point, um, you can raise your hand. Dr. Russell may use that to include some um, participation. So if you guys find that button, feel free to raise your hand now. At any point, if you have questions, go ahead and type it up in the question and answer section. I will be reading those to Dr. Russell at the end of her presentation. Um, so your questions will be answered, just may happen at the end of the presentation. So I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Russell here. Um, now, Dr. Russell has been with Nittany Eye Associates for about 10 years, um, and she does practice primarily out of the Tyrone office. So some of you may have seen her before, um, but we are very excited to have her here for her presentation. I'll go ahead and pass it on over to Dr. Russell when she's ready, and thank you all for joining us. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to the third week of the Nittany Eye webinar series. Um, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. As Rachel mentioned, um, my name is Andrea Russell. I'm an optometrist here at Nittany Eye Associates. And today I'm going to be talking about a condition called age-related macular degeneration and also giving you guys some tips that you can hopefully use to help protect your vision. Um, this is a condition that I've always been very passionate about. Unfortunately, I've had to watch multiple members of my own family suffer through this condition. And although it can be a scary disease, uh, the goal of this webinar is not to increase your fear or anxiety. I know we all already have more than enough of that going on right now, but instead I'm hoping to help you feel empowered that by in, um, utilizing some of these tips, you can really help significantly decrease your chances of losing vision from this disease. So with that, we're gonna get started. As Rachel said, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in and I'll try to answer them at the end. All right, so what is age-related macular degeneration? So um, age-related macular degeneration is commonly referred to as ARMD, and it's a condition where your macula, the tissue in the back of your eye, is damaged. Over the time, this damage can cause you to lose your central vision. The only good thing about this condition is that it does not typically affect your peripheral or side vision, so you actually usually do not go totally blind. This is kind of a little different than other diseases like glaucoma that actually can cause total blindness. So this is just a little diagram showing how somebody with um, macular degeneration actually sees the world. So one of the first things that a lot of my patients with this condition complain about is that they start having trouble looking at faces. You know, they're not quite able to figure out who people are, especially if they're standing far away. Um, patients also um, struggle a lot with reading early on. And as you can see, as these pictures go, kind of the, her, this little girl's face actually starts to get blurred out as the disease advances. This is something that I noticed a lot with my own aunt. As her disease progressed, she often couldn't know who we were until we started talking. So how big a deal is this? Um, this is definitely a pretty big deal and something that's worth paying attention to. It is the leading cause of severe vision loss in patients over 65. In 2010, the CDC estimated that approximately 2 million Americans had macular degeneration and they actually predict that that number will more than double by 2050. Patients with severe vision loss may no longer be able to drive, read, cook, or take care of themselves. Um, although treatments are effective, they can be expensive and are often painful. So just a little bit, um, what is your ma macula? Just a little bit of anatomy. So your macula is the part of a tissue in the back of your eye known as your retina. And although the macula makes up a very small portion of your retina, it is almost entirely responsible for your central vision. It is also what allows you to see fine detail and allows you to appreciate colors. So here's a little diagram and I'm just gonna kind of show you a couple of these parts. So the first part of your eye is what we call the cornea and that is clear. And then right behind that is your iris and this is actually a muscle. And most people, you know, it's blue, green, brown, hazel. And then in between there is a little hole that is called your pupil. And then behind that is your lens. And this is another clear structure. And this is the part we talk about when we discuss cataracts or cataract surgery. And then you can see this tissue back here, this red orange tissue is your retina. And within the tissue, 
this little tiny spot um, that's a little bit darker is your macula. And this is the area that we're talking about. And your macula is where a large portion of the light sensitive cells in your retina are found. And what these cells do is they actually collect the light and then they send a signal through your optic nerve to your brain and that helps you form an image. So this is definitely a very important part. Um, over to my right, this is a picture. This is kind of showing you a little bit about what we look at when we're bringing you into our office and dilating your eyes. So you can see, um, you know, of course you can see the retina tissue. You can also see your optic nerve right here, you know, in all of your blood vessels. And this little dark area, this is what we're really checking closely when we're looking for macular degeneration to make sure that there's no signs of it. So as a lot of you are probably aware, there are two types of macular degeneration. Um, first, we have the dry type. And this is by far the most common. And basically in this type, um, your macula starts to thin over time. You get the um, buildup of these waste products that we refer to as drusen. And you can see them right in here, these yellow products. And then in wet, this is usually the little bit more severe form. You can actually start to get some bleeding in the back of your eye. So as I mentioned, the dry form is by far the most common type. In fact, over eight out of 10 people with macular degeneration have this form. Um, the onset is usually very gradual. A lot of times we see patients with these deposits in their eyes for years before they actually start to notice any decrease in their vision. Some people really never notice a decrease in their vision. Um, but what happens is the macula starts to thin and then um, these waste products kind of start to build up over time. Um, the vision loss with this condition can be very mild, as I said, but unfortunately, in some cases, it can also be very severe if these products continue to um, build up and destroy the retina. The downside with this condition is that there's actually no treatment for the dry type. Um, however, there are certain supplements and lifestyle changes that we're going to talk about that can really help slow down the progression. So the other type is the one that most patients are you know, a little bit more scared of, and this is the wet form. Um, as I said, it's much less common, but it is usually very severe. And the vision loss is often sudden with this condition. You can have you know, pretty good vision one day, and the next day you can really lose almost all of your central vision. So what happens in this condition is new blood vessels actually start to form underneath the retina. Um, however, unlike our normal blood vessels, these blood vessels are very weak and fragile, and so they can often start to bleed and leak fluid and blood into your eye, as you can see in this picture. Of course, you know, this blood sitting here, you know, is toxic to your retina and over time can really start to damage it and destroy these cells. Um, although this can be devastating, the good news with this is if we catch this condition early, we can treat it pretty effectively with treatments. So um, we're gonna go on to some of the risk factors. So one of the unique things about this disease is that there are some risk factors that are out of your control, but there's also quite a few that we're able to control at least to some extent. Um, so we're going to start with the ones out of your control. Of course, age is the biggest risk factor. That's why this disease is called age-related macular degeneration. We rarely see this condition if you're under 50. Um, in fact, most of my patients are usually in their 70s or 80s when they're starting to have problems with this disease. Um, family history is a big risk factor. You know, as I said, it does tend to run in families. If your mom had this or your sister or your brother, you're definitely at a much higher risk. Um, race. Almost all the cases are in Caucasians. You know, I think about 90% of the cases are people that have light skin. Um, specifically, people with blue eyes, green eyes, you know, the light hair. You know, it can affect you if you have brown eyes, but it's definitely the lighter your skin, the lighter your eyes, the higher your chance of getting this disease. Um, female gender is also a risk factor. Now, this is partly thought to be because females do have a longer life expectancy. You know, so the longer you live, the more likely you're able to get this disease. So now we're gonna move on to some of the ones that we can actually start to control. So the biggest thing is smoking. I'm sure a lot of you know, you know by now that smoking can harm multiple parts of your body, but it is particularly bad for your macula. Um, a lot of studies have actually found that smoking can increase your chances of developing macular degeneration by up to four times. Um, and this is important, not just with firsthand smoke, but also with secondhand smoke. You know, so if you have this disease or you have family members with this disease, you really want to try to quit smoking and also encourage your significant others, your family members to quit smoking as well. Um, poor diet is also a risk factor. If you're eating foods really high in cholesterol and fat, a lot of processed foods, you know, this can also contribute. 
um, being overweight plays a role, as well as other systemic diseases such as high blood pressure and heart disease. I like to tell my patients that macular, your macula is very similar in a lot of ways to your heart. You know, it's very vascular. A lot of the things that are good for your heart are also good for your macula. You know, making sure you have regular exercise, eating a healthy diet, all that will definitely help your macula. So um, a little bit about how this is diagnosed. There's really only one good way to diagnose it, and that, that's with a dilated eye exam. Now, of course, this is most of your least favorite parts when you come to our office. This is where we put those drops in that kind of make you blurry, make you real light sensitive. But the reason we put those drops in is because they actually paralyze that eye muscle that constricts the pupil. So what that means is that the pupil, the hole in your eye actually stays bigger. So we're able to get a real clear view of the retina tissue in the back. This is um, really important for looking at macular degeneration. Um, if for some reason you really don't like the eye drops, we do have another really good option called the OptiMap. This is something that's only available in our state college office. This is a big machine that uses a low power laser to take a really good image of the back of your eye. What's nice with this machine is a lot of times it can save you from the dilation as long as we can get good views with it. So the other three instruments we're not really using to diagnose, but we are using these to monitor the condition. The first one is fundus photography. This is pretty simple where we basically just take a picture of the back of your eye, um, similar to what I showed you earlier in these slides. The next one is called the OCT, that stands for Ocular Coherence Tomography. Um, and this is probably the most important um, instrument for monitoring macular degeneration. We're actually gonna talk about it a little bit more on the next slide. And then the last one is called a fluorescein angiography. This is a machine that we actually used a lot um, before the OCT imaging started getting so good. However, now this one is used a little less frequently. Basically what happens in this test is we actually um, inject a chemical um, called fluorescein into your arm. And then we take a series of pictures as that dye travels through the blood vessels in your eye. That helps us figure out exactly where um, some of the blood vessels are leaking, helps us differentiate if this is dry or wet form of the macular degeneration. However, as I said, this one's done less commonly now. We don't do it at all here at Nittany Eye. Um, but if we do diagnose you with wet macular degeneration and send you to a retinal specialist, you may still have this test done. So onto the OCT, um, this is probably most of our favorite instruments. I know it is my favorite instrument, not just for monitoring macular degeneration, but for monitoring a whole bunch of different eye diseases. Um, if you tuned into Dr. Um, Simmer's webinar a few weeks ago, you probably heard him talk about this um, machine in a condition called glaucoma. Um, but this machine is also equally important for monitoring macular degeneration. It gives a cross-sectional images of your retina and this allows us to see fluid or bleeding on the retinal layers beneath the surface. So this is really important because when we dilate your eyes and we look in, we can really only see what's going on in that top layer. Um, with the OCT though, we're actually able to visualize the nine other layers that are beneath. So there's actually 10 layers to your retina. And with this OCT, we're actually able to visualize all of them. So this helps us differentiate between the wet and the dry form. It helps us to effectively monitor treatments and the best part about this test is that it is non-invasive. You know, it does not require a shot. Um, it does not require a nurse or a doctor to be present in the room when it's being done. Um, it's a very quick, easy, painless test. So I'm just gonna show you a couple images from this test so you kind of know what we're looking at when we're talking about it. Um, so this top image is a healthy macula, you know, probably of a young, healthy person. Um, and you can see, even to an untrained eye, you can um, really clearly see that there's different layers involved in this retina. So if you go down to the next picture, this is someone that has kind of a moderate form of dry age-related macular degeneration. <clears throat> you can see these little deposits that we were talking about. And you can also appreciate that the macula in general is thinned compared to this top picture where it's nice and thick and healthy looking. And then if you go down to the bottom picture, this is um, where someone has actually started to convert to the wet form of age-related macular degeneration. And you can start to see pockets of fluid or blood within the retinal layers and even beneath the retinal layers. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about treatment. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but as we said before, there's really no treatment for the dry type. Um, however, supplements and lifestyle changes definitely can help. Um, the wet, we also recommend supplements and lifestyle changes but this is where we usually are sending you out to have an injection. 
Um, this, of course, you know, is very scary when we tell people that um, they're going to have to have this done, you know, with good reason. You know, none of us like shots in general, yet alone talking about them when they're going to your eye. However, the good news with this is um, most of our patients do find that the injections are not quite as scary or as painful as they anticipate. Most of the retinal um, specialists that we work with are really good at helping to calm your fears. They're numbing your eyes with drops really good before these, they're doing these injections. So you're feeling pressure. Most of the time you're not feeling actual pain. You know, they're usually going in from underneath or to the side. They're usually not going straight in. So it's not quite as scary, but still not fun, but definitely worth it to preserve your vision. So now on to the good part, you know, what can you do to help lower your chance of getting this disease? Or if you have it, what can you help do to slow it down? So there's really kind of three things. You can look at some lifestyle changes. You can start adjusting your diet or adding some supplements. And the third thing, and probably the most important is you can make sure that you're getting routine eye exams, you know, at least um, once a year, you know, possibly more often if you actually have this condition. So some lifestyle changes, you know, we already talked about um, quit smoking. This is probably the most important thing. But the next important one is making sure you're wearing sunglasses and hats when you're outside. The reason that this disease affects people with light skin and light eyes is um, due to the high UV damage. So wearing sunglasses, you are protecting your eye from UV damage and helping your macular pigment stay healthy. Um, I tell all my patients that are diagnosed with this, one of the first things we talk about is how important it is to start wearing sunglasses. But I also tell my patients that, unfortunately, most of the damage that happens from the sun, you know, both to your eyes and your skin, actually happens before the age of 18. So it's still important, you know, if you're 65 and you're diagnosed with this, it's still important to wear sunglasses to prevent further damage, but it's not going to reverse the damage that's already been done. So that's why it's so important, you know, if you have kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and you're diagnosed with this disease, you really want to make sure that you start talking to them now about the importance of wearing sunglasses, especially in children. Um, and with that note, I'm actually just going to jump ahead in a slide quick just to show you some of my two favorite sunglass models. This is my son and my niece. And you know, it's just showing that it's never too early to start them in sunglasses. A lot of people worry that their kids and the babies won't like them. Um, but most babies actually tolerate them really well, especially if you get them used to it when they are young. Um, my little boy is actually almost three now, and he will usually remind me to get his sunglasses if we start to leave the house without them. So I'm just going to go back to this previous slide. So the next thing is eating a healthy diet. Um, the Mediterranean diet really is thought to be ideal. You know, um, anything high in fruits, veggies, um, fish, nuts. Unfortunately, in central Pennsylvania, this is something that's kind of hard to do. You know, we don't have access to seafood. Um, we don't even have good access to a lot of fruits and veggies in the winter season. You know, so sometimes it is hard to do, but we do encourage people to do it the best they can. You know, if for some reason you don't like a lot of those healthy foods, or you're, you, know, you travel a lot, or you just have trouble preparing healthy meals, you know, you might actually want to start thinking about supplementing, especially if you do have this condition or if you're at high risk for it. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of those specific supplements, but even starting just a good quality multivitamin can be a good first step. A lot of the multivitamins, especially the ones for 55 plus, are starting to add a lot of these supplements that we recommend for macular health. Um, so the last step is making sure that you're exercising and controlling your weight. You know, we tell people even just going for a walk, you know, try to aim for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, five times a week. You know, just getting your cardio, your heart pumping, everything like that can really help increase the blood flow to your eyes and just help increase the nutrients, keeping that macular region healthy. All right, so on to some supplements. So if you have macular degeneration or you've ever read up on it, one thing that you've probably come across is this word, this word called ARADS2. So what that stands for is um, this was a National Eye Institute study that was done. And they actually did two studies, um, one and two and it's called age-related eye disease study. And basically what they were looking at is whether or not high dose antioxidants and supplements could actually decrease the chance of developing certain age-related eye disease. Um, in particular, they were looking at macular degeneration. Um, and what they found is that yes, you know, a lot of these um, vitamins, they can't really prevent the disease from happening, but they can slow it down once you have it. Um, so there are a couple of different forms on the market. Um, the big one is probably Preservision. Um, this one is usually a twice a day formula. Um, but there's also a couple other ones. You know, I Promise is one that um, we do like here at Nittany Eye as well. 
And then Occubyte also has a formula. What's nice with this one is it is a once, um, most of the formula is once a day formula. Um, another nice thing about this is that we are starting to realize that not the same vitamins are not always good for everybody. So something that's a little bit exciting is that now we are actually able to run a genetic test just by doing a cheek swab. This is something that we've just recently started doing here at Nittany Eye. We can actually send away that swab and we can get a report telling us more specifically what type of vitamin you're going to benefit from the best. Um, this is really important, um, especially in, for um, something called zinc. You know, certain people tend to tolerate zinc very well, where other people don't tolerate it or don't need it as much. So that's something that's kind of exciting. You know, if you're taking one of these vitamins and you're interested in having that test done, just let your doctor know the next time you're in for an exam and we can talk to you a little bit more about whether or not you would benefit from that. So the next thing is looking for foods with omega-3 fish oils in. Of course, this is mostly gonna come from your cold water fish. Um, salmon is probably the best source. You can also get some omega-3 um, oils though from things like nuts, especially walnuts. Um, you can also start looking for foods that include butene and zeaxanthine. Um, these are macular pigments and they're really important in protecting your macular tissue. A lot of people actually refer to these as internal sunglasses. What that means is that um, these help prevent the UV rays from reaching your macula. Studies have found that people um, with macular degeneration or that are at high risk for it actually have significantly less concentration of these pigments in their macula. So um, a lot of studies are now showing that if we can increase the amount of these pigments, you know, it can be very protective. So um, lutein is something that's pretty easy to add to your diet. A lot of green leafy vegetables have this in. So spinach, kale, broccoli, really anything green is going to have some amount of lutein in. Um, zeaxanthine can be a little bit harder to add. Um, however, it is found in small amounts of in corn and orange, yellow peppers, also in egg yolks. Um, if for some reason, again, though, you don't think you're able to get enough of these nutrients, but you are worried about macular degeneration, you could look at um, supplementing these separately. Of course, if you are already taking an ARADS2 vitamin that's been prescribed by your doctor, they do include the lutein and the zeaxanthine, so you really don't need to worry too much about supplementing with those. However, it's still always a good idea to try to add some into your diet. So the last part that you can do is to make sure you get routine eye examinations. Um, you know, we recommend for everyone once a year, especially if you're over 65. Um, but if you have macular degeneration, oftentimes we're going to recommend that you come in even more often. Um, you know, early detection is probably the most important part of this condition. You know, most people will actually have no symptoms. Most of my patients that I diagnose with, with this have no idea that they have this condition. A dilated eye exam is the best way to detect the changes. And frequent dilated visits are often needed to monitor this progression. Particularly, we want to make sure that you're not starting to convert to that wet form that will need an injection. Um, as I said, there's no tor um, cure yet, but there are treatments that are extremely effective, especially for the wet type. Um, your eye doctor may also be able to recommend lifestyle changes, supplements, or even at home um, ways that you can monitor your vision. You know, we often give people little grids and different things that they can do at home to kind of make sure that this isn't progressing. All right, so that is actually about all I have. I did list some websites that you can use for references. A lot of these websites um, you know, have some great information on if you still have more questions or if you're curious. Um, you know, so thank you for watching. And if you haven't already typed in your questions, you can feel free to do that now. And I'll try to do my best to answer any, um, as many as we have time for. If you think about additional questions later or if we don't have time to answer them, um, you know, you can always feel free to email me or you can call into our office and we'll be more than happy to answer those questions. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Russell. That was a great presentation. So we actually do have quite a few questions that came through. Um, so we'll try to answer as much as we can here in the next five to 10 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go right down the line. First one we have here is um, if you could please talk about macular pucker. Um, yeah, so we can talk a little bit about this. Um, macular pucker is not the same thing as macular degeneration. Um, there's actually quite a few different conditions that can affect your macula. So it does affect the same part of your eye. So macular pucker, pucker involves the same pictures that we showed. However, um, as I said, it's not the, the same disease process. And a lot of the stuff that we talked about here does not apply. Um, macular pucker um, is often caused, you know, it can be secondary from surgery, or sometimes, again, it can just happen with age. 
Um, but you basically can get like a little bit of fluid or you can kind of get like a little membrane that can actually pull away the macular region from that retina. So basically it does create a similar condition as the wet macular degeneration where you kind of get fluid underneath some of those retinal layers and it can cause its central blurry vision. Um, so this condition does cause similar um, symptoms, but as I said, it's not the same disease process. Next question here, are floaters related to this condition? Okay, that's a great question. Um, floaters typically are not related to this um, condition. Most of the time when we're getting floaters, it's because there's a substance in the back of your eye called your vitreous. And a lot of times this vitreous can kind of clump together. And then when the light shines through, you're actually getting like a shadow or what we call a floater. Um, some people can get floaters with um, macular degeneration, specifically if they have the wet form. You know, sometimes if you would get severe um, bleeding in the back of the eye, occasionally you can get some floaters associated with that. That is pretty rare. Most people with macular degeneration, um, there's really no link to floaters. So thank you. This one's not really a question, but I think it's super helpful. Um, Melinda is letting us know that Maine, Bay, and Barry in State College actually has fresh fish six days a week. So thank you for that. Um, that's really helpful. Yeah, thank you. That is great. Um, you know, we have seen that resource before, and that's a great place if you can go if you really want to try to incorporate, you know, more of this Mediterranean diet. Um, you know, that's a great place if you can get some fresh fish. So thank you very much for sharing that. Next question here is, should you start taking your AREDs to before you have been diagnosed? Okay, um, so that's another great question and kind of a um, tricky question. Um, for the most part, most of the studies, the AREDs studies, have really only found that these vitamins decrease the progression. So the studies are not recommending that you start taking that just because you're concerned or you have risk factors. You know, typically I only recommend people start taking them if I actually see macular degeneration um, and really that meet the criteria of that study. Um, however, you know, it's hard to say whether or not these supplements could really hurt you. Um, the reason we don't always recommend them is because they are very high dosages. You know, so certain vitamins, you know, if you're taking too high amount, if your body can't um, absorb them, you know, sometimes that can lead to other conditions that can cause some problems. So typically, if I don't see you, macular degeneration, I usually recommend that instead you try to um, either add lutein and zeaxanthin as a separate supplement. Those two are usually pretty safe if you use those in the right um, amounts. Um, we typically recommend lutein around 10 milligrams and zeaxanthin around two. Or what I recommend for most of my patients is trying to incorporate it in your diet. I'm really all these supplements are absorbed best through your diet. So, you know, if you can get them in food, the food form is going to be a lot safer and, um, you know, a lot more effective and you're going to avoid any risk of tox toxicity with that. So thank you. Do you mind hopping back to the next or the last slide? Someone is wanting to see um, those resources you had again. Yeah, let, yeah, let me see if I can get back to that here. There we go. Yep, so I can actually just keep that up if you guys want to copy those down or anything, so. Perfect. Thank you so much. Does entrance cover that cheek swab test that we have? Okay, so that's another good question. Um, some insurances do and some don't. Um, most of the time, the out-of-pocket cost has not been too high. You know, it's usually been between like $50 and $100. But that unfortunately is a question that, um, you know, you might want to call the office to kind of find out with your insurance. And unfortunately, even sometimes um, at the office, we're not able to figure that out 100%. You know, a lot of times we are trying to um, sometimes we can try to submit it to insurance, but some aren't covering it. But as I said, there is usually a cap on the max amount that you're allowed to pay. Um, you know, so most of the time you're not going to be paying a lot of money for this test. And for many patients, you know, it is being covered. What are the best kind of sunglasses to use? Yep. So I mean, really any, um, you know, you want to make sure that you are getting sunglasses from somewhere reputable. You know, all of our sunglasses do offer, you know, that full protection for UVA, UVB. Um, polarized sunglasses are also another great way. You know, if the um, sunglasses are indeed polarized, you know, they do offer the full protection. So you just want to make sure you're not getting cheap sunglasses. You know, you really don't want to be buying them at Dollar General or anything. You want to make sure that you're going into an actual eye doctor or ordering a reputable brand that has that UVA, UVB, or the polarization in there. And they don't have to be expensive, you know, especially some of the kids that I, um, the picture that I showed you with the kids' sunglasses, a lot of those are pretty um, reasonable priced. If you are diagnosed with dry, does it sometimes lead to wet or are they completely separate from each other? Yep, so that's a great question. Um, and the answer is most of the time, um, wet macular degeneration does start as dry. So um, yes, they are not two completely different processes. 
Um, and that's why if we diagnose you with dry, we usually do like to monitor you so closely. Because um, as I said, not most of them do not convert, but you know, about one to two out of 10 will kind of go on to form the wet macular degeneration from the dry. So I hope that that kind of answers that question. We have time for about two more. We still have quite a few questions, um, but we'll answer about two more here and kind of wrap it up so we don't take um, your guys' whole morning here. Um, let's see, does our clinic offer any device which measures macula pigment density? Um, yeah, so there is actually um, a device that does that. We used to do it a lot um, when we first got this device. Um, what we used to do is where you would go in and would measure your density. And then a lot of times we would use that to help prescribe supplements. So the I Promise supplement that we talked a little bit about earlier, um, that's kind of why that one originally came out. You know, so if people scored low on that macular density test, a lot of times we would start supplementing with the I Promise vitamins. Um, we really haven't used that one quite as much, you know, recently. Um, but, you know, there, that test is still out there, you know, if that's something that you're interested in. A lot of times now, though, we are kind of just recommending, you know, if you had a high risk, you know, you just start the lutein and the zeaxanthin um, supplements kind of separately. You know, and if you, we're starting to see a lot of the drusen, then we are recommending the specific AREDS formula. Final question here. Um, besides injections and the uh, treatments that you talked about, is there any other treatments to consider when you develop wet macular degeneration? Um, at this point, there's really not. You know, in the past, sometimes they would actually use lasers um, to treat some of these blood vessel growth. But um, now with injections, injections are really just so good. You know, that is, this is kind of the main thing that we're using to treat them at this point. Um, there are different types of injections. You know, so um, there has been some newer ones that actually last a lot longer, which are nice. They are actually researching putting in different implants, you know, that could kind of prevent you from needing um, regular injections. They may be able to be go ahead and put in an implant of the medication in your eye. However, at this point, um, most of our retinal specialists are still primarily using injections. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for all of your questions. Um, we still had quite a few and I'm so sorry we are unable to answer them right now, um, but please feel free to send us a message. Um, you can email us directly at info at um, You can send us an email there if you have a specific question or you can call us. Our phone number is 814-234-2015. Um, thank you all again and thank you, Dr. Russell. Yep, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and sign off then. Thank you.